Martin Anderson Klutz. I'm from Digital Echidna in London, Ontario. Um, here to talk to you all today about uh, using Drupal to provide federated search results. Uh, is everyone here familiar with the term federated search? Um, show hands, maybe? All right, that's a good number of you. Uh, how many are actually using federated search on one of your web properties currently? Okay, still a couple of you, and anybody doing that in Drupal right now? Okay, good. Um, this is the wiki definition of search, <coughs> sorry, federated search, but the, the short version is that it's, the concept of it is uh, from a single user query providing results that are a mixture of various sources. So uh, here's an example of a site that's doing that where it's, I guess you'd call it a bento box style approach where the results from each data source are actually kept separate so that the user can sort of visually see where each uh, set of results is coming from. So you can see there's actually different even um, media types uh, that are being shown to the user as results. Uh, but we're, what we're going to be talking about today is mostly uh, this style, where they see a single set of results that they can then filter down and, and narrow to uh, find exactly the type of information that they're looking for. You. So you can see here, uh, as an example, the, the color labels are actually even showing different formats that the various kinds of data or the various results are uh, available in. Some of the use cases for uh, federated search might be, um, you know, searching across multiple web properties. Uh, it might be something like providing results in a variety of different applications, either online or some kind of internet or, or you know, other types of application, um, as well as uh, giving a user an ability to search across collections of different information types. So like the one we saw before where it was providing results that were manuscripts or images or you know different kinds of things. There's a variety of different approaches to federated search. Uh, a query federator is one where it just accepts the query and then does kind of a real-time search that goes out to different uh, databases and gets those back and sort of presents them back to the user, either you know, making some effort to, to integrate them somehow or just, you know, as we saw with the Bento Box one, keeping them separate. A data lake would collect together um, all of the re remote information and without doing any kind of transformation, just sort of provide that as kind of a raw uh, mixture of results to the user. Um, a data hub would sort of normalize some of the data, so probably metadata, um, and then uh, still preserve kind of the native original format for the, the core data itself, and that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today. And then a, a more formal data warehouse would really try to, to integrate and homogenize the data so that it's really more of following a common data standard. So any questions about federated search before we move on? Okay. So what we're going to be talking about today is really kind of a case study around a project that I worked on where we were asked to replace the Google search appliance. Uh, anybody here have experience with the Google search appliance? Um, so um, Google Search Appliance, for those of you who don't know, is kind of this big yellow box that you drop into your um, server environment. And um, it's got the Google al algorithm kind of pre-installed on there. If you ever try to tamper with a thing, apparently these loud alarms go off and probably Google people will show up at your premises in short order. Um, it's uh, intended as a way to uh, use sort of the Google search expertise for your local data. Uh, one of the benefits to having that as opposed to a service is that if you have content that's not available to the website at large, uh, for example, you know, internet type content, you can still have it crawled uh, through that method. Um, it has kind of a, a web accessible or locally web accessible, uh, you know, online configuration, kind of a GUI for its configuration. Um, their documentation says that it can index not only web pages, but over 200 different kinds of documents. And uh, there's an existing contrib module for integrating that with Drupal, although I think the Drupal 8 version is not yet stable, may not be, because uh, Google has officially end of life the Google search appliance. They've told all of their customers that um, as of next year, all of those boxes need to, to go back to the home, the mothership. So um, that's why our client had asked us to help them build a replacement. So in terms of uh, what they were trying to do, uh, they wanted to provide 
visitors to their website with results, not only from the main Drupal website, but they also have a wiki site with lots of technical information. There's an e-store that's really a document repository. Some of them require payment, but a lot of them don't um, in a variety of formats, so PDFs, uh, document, Word documents, um, Excel spreadsheets, and maybe a few others. And then uh, also some sites that are really sort of more AJAX driven in terms of uh, how a user would navigate through those. So our goals for the replacement were largely a like-for-like -like replacement of the Google search appliance. So they wanted uh, blended results from all the properties, uh, autocomplete suggestions as the user is typing in their query, uh, spelling suggestions and synonyms in terms of how it interprets those um, query terms, and then the ability to sort of promote results or have, you know, if somebody types a specific query, then feature this example page at the top of those results. And then um, because we were uh, moving to a robust platform, uh, we also talked to them about adding faceted search as, uh, as a new piece of functionality. So the solution that we proposed for them was really based around Apache Solar, which um, probably in the Drupal community, most people are gonna be at least familiar with. Show of hands, everybody, how many people have used Solar? So yeah, it's pretty common nowadays. If you're using Pantheon or Acquia, you have uh, free access uh, to add that into your site, and it's you know, extremely robust, as I'm sure all of you have experienced. Um, at its core, it's using the, the uh, Lucene library for indexing and search, and uh, Lucene is also what's at the heart of um, other popular search platforms like Elasticsearch or uh, LucidWorks Fusion. Um, gives you things like faceted navigation, uh, hit highlighting, geospatial search, and you know, a whole bunch of others. Uh, notes on there that you can use plugins to, to provide even more functionality depending on you know, if you have the uh, server access to do all of that. Um, typically the configuration for solar is done through XML configuration as opposed to you know, the, uh, the uh, GUI interface like the uh, GSA. Uh, but it also has a bunch of uh, APIs and it does also have an admin interface. But uh, in addition to being popular in the Drupal community, Solar is in use by, you can see, a variety of household names, uh, some of which are, are pretty major and, and handle uh, all kinds of traffic on a daily basis. The piece that we added on to be able to, um, to provide the federated search was Apache Nutch um, because we needed something that could go out and crawl all of these sites, not all of which were even dynamic. Um, so Apache Nutch is a crawler that was designed to plug into Solar. It, um, it doesn't actually do any of kind of the, um, I'll say true indexing, but it's a crawler designed to go out and scrape content uh, from websites and then push that into Solar for where it will get indexed. Um, one of the things that was interesting, and we'll get into more detail about this, is that it comes pre-configured as kind of a whole web crawler, so it seems, at least in its initial configuration, intended to go out and crawl from site to site and sort of crawl and index everything that it can. Um, whereas it feels like a lot of people are using it how we were intending, which is um, to crawl a smaller number of client-owned sites and not venture out beyond that. So there was some configuration around that that we'll talk about. Um, but yes, so, so you can provide seed URLs and also place restrictions on where it should and shouldn't go. Another piece we added was Apache Tika, which is a powerful um, library for um, document parsing and um, integrates well, you know, being part of the um, you know, Apache suite of um, products, uh, integrates well with both Solar and Nutch, um, and it can uh, detect and extract metadata text from over a thousand different uh, file formats. So, uh, so definitely an upgrade there. And then in, in terms of integrating all of that with uh, Drupal itself, we were using Search API and Search API Solar. Um, basically, at its, you know, the core intent of those is to, uh, in integrating with Solar, it'll take all of your Drupal content and push that over to Solar where it'll get indexed, and then you can run queries against that and display those uh, results to your users, and typically you would use uh, views to uh, configure or configure and structure uh, those results um, as the means for presenting those within your website. Um, but it's extremely configurable, so you know you really have a lot of freedom 
uh, using that in terms of uh, what actually gets um, sent to your user. And then we also added search API attachments so that um, any nodes that have attachments within Drupal will also get those indexed. Um, there's a couple of different ways. Typically, as an organization, when we're using Tika, we'll have that on the web server um, where the Drupal, Drupal installation is, and in some ways that's an easier way to use it, but because of some of the um, client restrictions in terms of how they wanted things uh, configured, we had that on the solar server, and we were able to set up solar to provide access to Tika as kind of a service. Um, but Search API attachments does, uh, does allow for that. And we also used a module called Sarnia, which is a contrib module. Uh, right now it's only D7. Um, but it allows Drupal to display results that, um, that don't originate from Drupal content. Uh, so you can use any kind of a solar index and provide results from that. Um, but because of that, it's really read-only. It doesn't have any mechanism to push content from your uh, Drupal content into the, the solar core. And then the other note is that it's currently in use, or at least when the last time I checked, it was only in use by 191 sites, which a lot of times would be kind of a warning sign in terms of whether or not to use it. But for our case, it was really, uh, it really filled the need for what we were trying to do. So I wanted to show here um, kind of an illustration to demonstrate how what we were trying to accomplish really doesn't necessarily map exactly to the intended use for either Search API Solar or Sarnia. Um, so as I mentioned, typically with Search API and Search API Solar, you're using it to push content uh, through to Solar and then run queries and get results back and display those to the user. So it's a nice, clean sort of two-way communication. Whereas uh, Sarnia is typically more of a one-way communication in terms of only reading from Solar. So what we had to do was build kind of a hybrid solution where we were using Search API and Search API Solar in kind of their, I'll say, non sarni configuration to push content to Solar, having nutch crawl content and push um, the data that it was getting into that same Solar index and then using Sarnia to pull that out in kind of read-only uh, configuration. Does that all make sense? Any questions? So, taking this approach, some of the extra work that we had to do um, was normalize the solar field names. So, Search API Solar um, has a very particular way that it, like, it actually kind of needs to structure um, the uh, solar field names to work properly and nutch out of the box uses a, a very different um, standard for field names and so we had to make sure that those two were using the same field names so that we would get kind of a um, enough commonality in the data that we could, could pull them out as a single result set. The other thing is once you pull all of that back into Solar, or sorry, into Drupal, um, by pulling it through Sarnia you lose any of the um, I'll say the benefit of what Search API Solar normally does. So because you're starting with Drupal fields, it, it um, takes some of the, the work that you've already done in defining the fields and turns those into kind of intelligent decisions, for example, in your view as to how to present that data. And uh, the minute you, go, you start using Sarnia, um, it treats everything as just sort of raw data that it knows nothing about. So you actually, in your view, have to to uh, put extra effort into um, putting some of the configuration around how to properly present all of that data. Um, there were places where you have to uh, write hook implementations for things like facets. Um, so again, with Search API Solar, anytime you have, as, you, as an example, a taxonomy field, it would automatically know to, to associate the term ID that's in Solar with the actual facet name when it does things like display facets. Um, whereas, you know, we had to actually, you know, implement custom hooks and write some code to, to make all of that happen uh, when working through Sarnia with the same data. Um, as I mentioned before, we had to sort of manually configure all of the places where the, uh, the nut crawler should and shouldn't crawl, um, as well as making sure that it didn't sort of just venture off and start trying to, to crawl the, the internet as a whole. And, um, you know, there was some, some extra 
I'll say code-based configuration as opposed to uh, what uh, particularly the client web team was used to in terms of uh, you know web-based management or, um, of all of that. So from our standpoint, it was a plus because it was easier to manage the uh, the configuration between environments. But as I say, it's slightly different from from what they had been used to. So I thought I would give you all a bit of a sense of what some of this looks like under the hood, or at least in the, the Drupal UI, and, um, and give you a sense of how it differs from what you may be used to in looking at uh, standard search API. <clears throat> so here's your uh, search API index uh, page. And normally you'd see a single server and index. Um, but here, because we're using that, that hybrid approach, we've got a server and index set up for, I'll say, our standard communication with Solar, where it'll actually push the content to um, Solar, and then we've got a separate server and index um, set up for the, the Sarnia read that will pull in not only the Drupal index content, but also the content that was indexed through Nudge. And here's a look at uh, again, your standard search API configuration of the fields. Um, so you can see it's got the machine names, it's telling you which ones are indexed and the type. Um, the thing, one thing to point out is that uh, the boost values here um, are really query time boosts, so any uh, tweaking we would try to do here would sort of not actually make it through to the final implementation because the read is really coming through Sarnia. So. Um, that's one thing to be aware of if you ever decide to venture down this route. Um, the other thing I'll just point out, and I think it sounds like most of you are used to uh, solar, but just to, to point out for anyone who isn't, uh, the field types that are um, being fed into solar as strings are available as you know uh, filters and facets and sort by uh, type fields, um, but not aren't. Um, rendered or, or interpreted towards relevance, whereas the full text fields are the opposite. So they, they are sort of tokenized and, and used towards relevance, but then aren't available as facets. So that's one thing to be aware of. Uh, so, so here's where we start to get into what the Sarnia um, configuration looks like. And again, anybody who's used to search API will notice that um, that far right tab is something you haven't seen before uh, for Sarnia. And it actually provides, again, uh, a new row of um, tabs below that, local tabs, for um, managing the interaction that's specific to Sarnia. And a lot of them are, are basically read-only in terms of you don't really uh, need to do a lot within them. For example, this one is, is basically just giving you some of the information about um, the basic configuration and telling you that it's uh, automatically created an, an entity for you. Um, this next one is, is similar to the search API um, interface that we saw earlier, but again, read-only because it's um, basically showing you the data that it's getting from Solar. Um, and uh, the critical thing on this page is that little link at the top left that says refresh server fields because that's what tells Sarnia to go out to the Solar Index and really pull down all of the data that it uses. And, um, once you do that, you get all of those uh, field names, and that's what makes it available, all of those fields available when you go later on to build your view. And so what happens when you use Sarnia with views, that's a little different from what you're probably used to, is um, all of the fields that you're pulling from the solar index, you pull basically from a single field um, called data and then it has a solar property um, in there that you define to actually define the solar field that you're gonna read from. So um, as opposed to Search API Solar where all of your fields would show up individually and you could pick from them as you're adding them, here you would add data a bunch of times and then configure them in this interface. You can see here's all your solar fields. So that's where you're telling it which field you use as opposed to as you're adding the field. So a little bit counterintuitive, at least for those that are uh, those of you that are used to uh, search API um, in more of the, the standard configuration. And again, because you're having to tell it about all of the fields and you know what type of data is in there, it's important to pay attention to the formatter and make sure you're using something that's appropriate to the actual information. Any questions so far? No. 
So what are some of the surprises with Nutch? Well, by default, Nutch uses something called the OPIC scoring filter. And again, this goes back to the idea that Nutch is pre-configured for, you know, whole web crawling. And um, it's meant to emulate one of the core early ideas of Google, which is this idea that as you crawl, inbound links are treated as votes that um, should be interpreted as um, a way to tell which content is more relevant to a topic or not. And so what happens is when you use Nutch, in its default configuration for more of an intranet crawler where you're re-indexing the same content on a regular basis, this OPIC scoring filter will cause the recrawls to act as additional inbound links um, every time it recrawls them, unless you sort of, you know, totally discard your index every time. And so what a lot of people have found when they use Notch for intranet crawling is they have to discard this, otherwise over time, all of the crawled um, pages keep going up and up and up slowly, but steadily over time um, being treated as more and more relevant, whereas the, the Drupal content is unaffected. So gradually your crawled uh, results start pushing out all of your uh, Drupal index or Drupal index content. So um, fortunately it's just a single uh, change in the one uh, Nutch XML configuration file and, uh, and then that's dealt with, but that was a surprise. Um, also for the uh, our client's use case, they had uh, quite a large library of um, particularly PDFs, but as I mentioned, other types of content in their document repository. And between that and the, the number of sites that were being crawled, they ended up with some really huge index files that actually uh, filled up the data store that they were, um, that they were using, um, having Nutch uh, store its indexes on. So it actually filled up and ran out of space a, a few times. So we had to keep pushing that up um, to accommodate the, um, you know, the several gigabyte uh, files that were being generated. Um, one other thing to note with Nutch is that um, because it's not able to because you're not giving it structured data, it's, it's taking an assembled web page and ingesting that, it doesn't really know the difference between what we'd call the content of the page and all of the text on the page. So it's, by stripping out the text, it's got, you know, the, the page title, it's got, um, you know, if the, the title is in text at, in addition to a logo, that'll be in there. All of your main navigation, all of the text of the page is really ingested along with, you know, as I say, what we would typically call the content of the page. Um, at one point in the project, we did actually look at forking Nutch so that you could pass in um, almost like regex type patterns for each site to help it parse out, you know, the, the parts that we would consider sort of the, the body content as opposed to some of that chrome. Um, but ultimately, we ended up just going with the, the stock um, Nutch more for the sake of maintenance. Um, but anyway, if, if you use Nutch, that's one limitation to be aware of. Um, there was also some complex logic, particularly, particularly with their document repository in terms of making sure that it was crawling or properly interpreting the language for, um, again, particularly the, um, the different documents. And because you could have English pages linking to French documents and um, sometimes which language someone was getting was based on um, cookie, or, yeah, session variables. Uh, sometimes it was complex to make sure that um, we were giving Nutch the proper indication of which language to interpret that as. So that ended up being quite complex. <coughs> and then also, again, uh, because Nutch is you know, out of the box configured as a, a web crawler, it has default caps on how many links per page it will crawl and um, the size of page. And so we had to so sort of find and disable those for our purposes. But uh, once we did those, it actually worked quite well. Some of the surprises with Sarnia, um, a couple of times I think it was maybe if Solar was, uh, you know, offline or, um, you know, some various uh, configuration issues, it would occasionally kind of forget its schema. So, um, you remember we were on that page where it, uh, I think it was the second tab of its, you know, local tab set that had all the field lists. If you went in there, it would be completely empty and, you know, from the client's perspective, more critically, if you went to um, to search anything, it would just not give any results. Um, 
So you just had to go to that page, hit, um, you know, retrieve uh, solar uh, schema or whatever it was, solar fields, and it would uh, pin the, the solar um, core again and, and get all of that information. Everything would, would get working again. But we had, you know, one or two panic calls from the client where they um, couldn't understand why everything had stopped working. Unfortunately, that one was, was a really easy fix. Um, there were a couple of times where, um, you know, as we talked about, um, you know, Sarnia is really not in wide use right now, so I think we were probably trying to use it for things that maybe hadn't even been used for before. So there were places where we actually got sort of like critical PHP errors that gave us white screens of death and had to, to patch Sarnia along the way. So, um, you know, definitely some learning there and, you know, happy to contribute back to the project. Um, and then the other thing that we encountered that was interesting, and I guess an example of what we were just talking about, is that we realized that there was actually no way within the search results to tell it to only display results that were in the language of the current user. So we ended up having to patch both Sarnia and the token module to, so that we could use a token uh, to accomplish that. So more generally, some notes about crawling. Um, when um, we're using search API attachments, it takes the content of those attachments and it adds it to the content of the node. So any, any relevance to a particular subject that's within the attachment counts towards the node. Um, whereas with an indexer, you don't necessarily have that kind of strict sense of what the relationship is of a document to a page. So really those two things are treated as separate. And so there's a difference there in terms of how those things are treated. And I don't necessarily know that that's something that you can fix. It's probably just if you're using a mixture of those two things to understand that, that there is a difference between how those two environments will be treated. Um, in our experience, uh, the nudge crawler really put a heavy load on the server. So we did some things to, to dial it back a little bit, but then also worked with the client to make sure that it was crawling you know, at night or at, at non-peak times for the, uh, the particular web servers. And um, we discovered that um, because the Drupal data has metadata, things like you know, taxonomies that have been associated, you can do things like fastening, but obviously you're not going to have any of that same metadata for the crawled results. So anytime you apply any facets, you immediately exclude any of the crawled data. Um, and and then you know as we talked about, some of the uh, content doesn't necessarily lend itself particularly well to crawling. So particularly things that are AJAX built and um, especially things that don't have URLs that can be indexed um, properly. That isn't really going to be uh, content that you can index well with, with something like Nutch. So some lessons learned. Um, you know, as we talked about, fastening across data sources is challenging. You really have to have uh, common metadata that you can use um, if you want um, you know, facets to work well in terms of helping um, users to, to identify common content across data sources. Uh, duplication can also be an issue. So there were definitely places where they had made Drupal nodes to help people find, for example, content that's on the document repository. But then once all of that gets into the same search index, uh, you might end up with both of those in a search result and really pointing to the same place. Um, and then relevancy across data sources can be a challenge. So um, because you're using um, you know, solar ingestion <coughs> through Drupal that is you know, highly structured and you have lots of metadata and a lot of uh, sophistication in terms of how you can uh, parse that versus Nutch, which is you know, less, much less structured. And, uh, and as I say, you're, you're ingesting all of the text of the page as opposed to, um, I'll say, the most meaningful parts of it. Um, the degree to which it's, it's really interpreting all of that content the same is, is sort of hard to keep equivalent and, and can requ require a lot of uh, fine tuning. And I also uh, thought I would uh, touch on here, <clears throat> what would it look like to try and do some of this in Drupal 8? So if you look at Search API Solar in Drupal 8, this, uh, in the configuration, the bottom uh, part of it here has this uh, checkbox for uh, multi-site compatibility. Um, I think it was in the, um, the one keynote speech yesterday where they were talking about how in um, Drupal 8, Search API Solar is using the Solarium library to interact with Solar, so it provides 
a much better layer of abstraction in terms of dealing with solar in a way that isn't specific to Drupal. And so one of the benefits is that it, it is able to um, provide kind of that multi-search uh, capability. It does still at this stage expect the sta standard schema.xml, so it, it has still a lot of expectations in terms of how the content should be structured and if, in order for it to be able to use it properly. So it works better for providing federated search across Drupal sites as opposed to you know Drupal and non-Drupal or you know um, a variety of things. They did touch on the search API data source, which is a promising um, possibility for providing again non-Drupal content. But at this stage, it's you know it's available on GitHub. It's in, in a sandbox on Drupal.org, but um, you know sort of buyer beware, I suppose. Um, so that's really it, um, and I was going to throw it open to questions now. Is anybody? Yeah. There are some questions. I'm actually the maintainer. Oh, okay, awesome. Uh, so I'm really gratified that you're actually doing Yeah, yeah, no, it's it, it really. I mean, it was a big help for us. So. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, just the uh, in the community spirit of uh, if you have patches. Yeah, we, we submitted some, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, some of them got into a couple of the releases earlier this year, so oh, that was great, yeah. Uh, but that's, that's all great. Yeah, awesome. Oh, great. Uh, any other questions, comments? Uh, and I'll let you have the rest of your afternoon, so thanks, everyone.